Keto and crime, keto and crime. We uncover the crime on keto and crime. Keto and crime, keto and crime. Now is the time for keto and crime. Hey everyone, welcome back to Keto and Crime. Today we have the story of one of the most cruel men to ever walk the face of the earth. In our continuing series on mad medical experiments, today we have the war crimes and medical crimes of Dr. Joseph Mengele. The mad Nazi doctor. Now, this is not going to be an in-depth autobiography of Dr. Mengele. This is going to be a brief overview of his past, kind of a synopsis of his personality. And then we're going to talk specifically about his medical experiments. If you want a super in-depth autobiography about it, I recommend the great Stephanie Harlow's, I think, four-part series on Dr. Mengele. And I will link the first of that right up here. So go check her out if you want, you know, kind of like I did with Jim Jones, the in-depth, you know, deep dive. Go, go check that out. But this is just going to be an overview of his experiments, what happened, and the aftermath. Uh, with that being said, please, if you'd like to support the channel, those links are down below. Uh, always appreciated, never required. There's uh, memberships, Patreon, uh, links to make a one-time donation, or you can simply support me by getting yourself some Keto Crisp. Those links are down below as well. And with that being said, without further ado, a big shout out to all my patrons, all my channel members. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And let's jump into this. Dr. Joseph Mengele. Joseph Mengele was born in Gusenberg on March 16, 1911. He was the oldest of three sons, born to Walburga and Carl Mengele. His father and his other brothers founded Carl Mengele and Sons, a producer of farm machinery. So he came from a family of entrepreneurs and manufacturers. He was by far the brightest of the children and uh, his parents doted on him. He did very well in high school and had an early interest in both military and science. He absolutely loved scientific research and aspired to uh, do something with with that profession. He also had a keen interest in music, art, and skiing. So he was by far a well-rounded young man and quite handsome by all accounts. So he was very, very popular in the town of Gusenberg. After graduating high school in 1930, he went to study philosophy at Munich. Now Munich was the headquarters of Adolf Hitler's burgeoning Nazi party. Now, to really understand what was going on here, we have to understand what was going on in Germany after World War I. As I mentioned in my um, video on uh, the bitch of Birkenau, and I'll put that right up here, uh, Germany was undergoing a radical transformation. It was it was spanked beyond spanked in World War I, and as a result, of the Allies put a lot of heavy uh, restrictions and financial obligations on Germany, and um, they were reeling from a financial depression, and then, of course, you had the effects of the Great Depression, which hit in 1929 that affected the whole world, and uh, radical inflation. We would know something about that right now. Uh, which made the German mark worth practically nothing. There were stories of people having to uh, pay their employees twice to keep up with the devaluing of the mark, and uh, stories of people having to take wheelbarrows full of cash to buy groceries. So, yeah. Uh, not a good time. Uh, very, very radically uh, small business not doing well. The... Uh, the provisional government that had been established after World War uh, One was just 
the Weimar Republic was not doing uh, not doing well. They were doing their best, but they were not doing well. And as a result, radical movements started to take hold, and among them were was Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Workers Party, or Nazis. And uh, many Nazis, uh, well, let's say many Germans, not Nazis, but Germans, uh, were drawn to this because Adolf Hitler promised to fix Germany, to fix the problems. And unfortunately, one of the major things that he uh, blamed for the downfall of, of Germany was the loss of World War One, and he put that blame squarely on the shoulders of anyone that was not a pure Aryan German, a pure German of Nordic or Aryan descent, and that of course included the Jews. So that was the propaganda that was coming out of the Nazi party, and the Nazi party had become the most prominent of these radical parties. Uh, they had won uh, quite a few parliamentary seats by this time, and were radically taking uh, taking over when it all culminated in uh, Hitler's forcing his way into becoming chancellor, and we all know what happened after that. But Mengele, being a handsome young man, aspiring young man of pure Aryan blood, ended up going to college in Munich, where the uh, headquarters of the Nazis were, and he ended up joining them. He joined the uh, forerunner called the Stahlhelm. We talked about that again in my, my previous video. The brown shirts, you know, they were a paramilitary organization that was later uh, absorbed into the SA and then into the SS. Uh, he joined them and was basically out there as a street enforcer for the Nazis, in addition to working on his higher education. In five years, he had received his Ph.D. in anthropology from the University of Munich. And he joined the Institute for Hereditary Biology and Racial Hygiene. Isn't that a lovely name? In Frankfurt. By, not, by 1935, Nazi influence is everywhere, and that included in academia. Uh, most uh, people that were left in higher uh, education were supporters of, if, not they were, if they were not Nazis themselves, they were supporters of the Nazi regime. So, uh, in, in, him being in higher education, in the city where uh, the Nazis were headquartered, he was very, very well radicalized by the time he graduated. And when he joined the Racial Hygiene Institute there in Frankfurt, who was a German geneticist who enjoyed researching identical twins. And if we know anything about Joseph Mengele, we know that he enjoyed working with twins. And no one had been more indoctrinated than Otto von der Schur. He is an in-depth study of him uh, all on his own, but he was a radical Nazi when it came to the research of genetics and eugenics, which, as we all know, eugenics is basically the practice of purifying a race. So he was at the forefront of exactly what to do with not Aryans. And as Vishore's assistant, Mingala became even more radicalized. He focused on genetic factors that result in cleft lips or palates, cleft chins, any imperfection. Remember, the Germans were purists. The Nazis were purists. Excuse me to all my German, uh, people of German descent. Did not mean it that way. Nazis were racial and genetic purists. They believed that perfection should be the aim of any society, and they hoped to basically breed out all imperfections in all people. So eventually, if you think about it, the Jewish people, the homosexuals, the gypsies, the disabled, the people, the deformed, the people that they were basically getting rid of, for lack of a, for the most simplistic terms, eventually that wouldn't have been good enough because they were purists. They would have turned against everyone eventually. But uh, Mengele was at the forefront of this, and he actually wrote his thesis on, uh, on cleft palates and how to prevent them.
so you would have seen a lot of weird genetic experiments coming forth by this. Uh, in 1938, in addition to his PhD, he earned uh, his MD, the uh, German equivalent of a medical doctor in 1938 from the University of Frankfurt. Uh, Dr. Vachur's uh, letter of recommendation was uh, primary in helping him release that. Now, a lot of Mengele's work was not radical. It was just basic scientific mainstream research. And many people have said that if Mengele had not been a radical Nazi, that um, a lot of his work might have still been in journals today. If he had just been a German doctor that was caught up in happenstance, though, that didn't do all the evil things that he did, he would have st probably still been published in certain journals today. Ironically, all of his degrees were eventually revoked by the universities in the 1960s. So, uh, while in Frankfurt, he started dating Irene Chauvin, who uh, he met while working as a medical resident, and they eventually married in 1939, soon after he became a medical doctor. As we said earlier, Mengele had joined the Nazi party and specifically the brown shirts, which, which would later become the SS. He also uh, actually joined the German army with uh, the efforts of the Nazis to push into Poland and other neighboring countries. Remember, they were all about Germanic people. They were all about pure Nordic descent Aryans. So that included getting rid of the Slavs and the Jews and anybody else. And Slavs are, is kind of, I don't really like the term Slav. I mean, I know it's not necessarily derogatory. It's not derogatory, but it just sounds. But these are people of more Russian descent than Germanic. So they're considered by, they were considered by the Nazis a lesser people. So he started to push into areas like Poland, Finland, where there was a lot of people of Slavic descent. So, yeah. So, Mingala uh, joined the army, and in 1941, he was posted in the Ukraine, where he actually did win the Iron Cross for bravery. He was part of the 5th SS Panzer Division and was the battalion medical officer. As I said, he won the Iron Cross for bravery for rescuing two German soldiers from a burning tank. Uh, he was also uh, awarded a Medal of Bravery for just field medicine. He wasn't a field surgeon that kind of hung back. He would actually go into the fray if needed to take care of the wounded. Now, as evil as he was, I think this is a great virtue uh, for anybody to have. But he served well in the German army, and he was actually wounded, uh, in a battle and was declared unfit for active military duty after that wound. So he was discharged from the active uh, German army in 1942 and returned to medicine and research under the tutelage of Dr. Verschur, who was now working in Berlin at uh, Nazi headquarters, the SS Race and Settlement main headquarters in Berlin. So he was working with a radical geneticist, a radical uh, pusher of, of euthanasia, of eugenics. And when I say euthanasia, I mean euthanasia, not in its typical understanding. And uh, helped found the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute of Anthropology, Human uh, Heredity, and Genetics. And and worked with him in Berlin on how to make the Aryan race more pure, how to get rid of those pesky non-white Aryans, and just generally a lot of tomfoolery. By mid to late 1942, uh, he took an interest in the camps, uh, Auschwitz in particular. Now, Auschwitz, uh, too, also part of Birkenau, uh, was originally intended to house slave labor, and once they had worked them to death, would be exterminated. Uh, but it was also a camp in which SS doctors were conducting selections on the incoming Jews. They are prisoners in general. They would uh, look at them, determine who was fit for labor and who wasn't, 
and then select who is to live and who is to die. Any images that you've seen of for movies where people are herded off the trains, divided, and then you have Nazi doctors walking up and down looking at them, choosing who lives and who dies, that actually came from Auschwitz. Usually about three quarters of those that arrived were chosen to die immediately. They usually only kept males and females you know, late teens to very late, to, to late twenties, and uh, everyone else was marched off to die. By 1943, uh, Mengele had taken a huge interest in Auschwitz, and Dr. Vashore encouraged him to apply for transfer for concentration camp service, and he did. And he was posted, of course, to Auschwitz, where he became the it man when it came to selecting who lives and who dies. Now, Auschwitz was kind of unique in that they would actually send wounded or sick prisoners to uh, the infirmary, but they were actually uh, not treated by Nazi doctors. Nazi doctors felt it was beneath them to actually treat them, so they would treat, they would basically constrict prisoners that had a medical background, either as medics or doctors, nurses, to care for them, and they would oversee the treatment. Mengele felt that even those tiny bit of resources was wasted on the on these non-Aryan prisoners. So he would uh, visit the hospitals regularly, two to three times a month, and anyone that had been in the infirmary for more than two weeks was sent to the gas chamber because he didn't want to waste any more resources on them. He also, as medical director of the camp, would go to the trains and help do the medical selections, though it was not his duty to do that. And he also began calling out people for his medical experiments, which, with Dr. Brashear's help, continued even at Auschwitz. In addition to that, most people that knew him said that he was very sadistic. Uh, most Nazi doctors were still doctors at heart. A lot of them were were just Germans that had thought, you know, had were victims of happenstance themselves. You know, they couldn't really be a doctor unless they were a Nazi, so it was kind of a catch-22. But they still took their Hippocratic Oath very seriously to do no harm, and a lot of them hated having to select who lived and who died. They hated to have to uh, go down to the gas chambers and uh, inspect the cyanide capsule Zyklon B, which was the cyanide-based pesticide that was used to gas people. Uh, they hated that, but Mingala loved it. They said that his eyes would dance. He loved playing God uh, over these people. And so, yeah. Uh, in late 1943, there was an outbreak of Noma, a... Uh, Bacterial disease that basically causes uh, gangrene to form on the mouth and face. And uh, it actually happened at the Romani camp, which was kind of a satellite camp of Auschwitz. And Mengele decided, instead of just treating this outbreak, he would use it to further his research. So he constricted uh, Dr. Berthold Epstein, a Jewish pediatrician uh, who was for, had the misfortune of, you know, being a prisoner and isolated anyone that had it in two separate barracks, men, women, children. He actually, instead of treating them, would study them, study the disease's progression. He even had several of the children that had it killed and all the vital organs had preserved and sent to an SS medical academy and grants and for further study. Uh, this research was still going on. They never really cured that outbreak. It's just if you got it, you got sent to be experimented on by Mingula and Epstein. And that uh, research was never concluded. It was still ongoing when that camp was basically abandoned by the Nazis and everyone there was killed. Later outbreaks of typhus, scarlet fever, uh, were kind of, kind of dealt with in almost the same way. Instead of treating the people, they were killed. They would literally go from uh, barracks to barracks. They would take anybody that was in a barracks that had people that were infected with any of these diseases, they would take them to the gas chamber. They would kill them, 
they would disinfect the barracks and then they would uh, move the healthy people into another barracks until it was completely fumigated and so on and so forth. It was kind of a house-to-house -house search for the sick. Now, uh, that's how he dealt with all further outbreaks as well as taking samples to send to uh, the SS Institute for research. And he actually received a War Merit Cross for his work in preventing outbreaks spreading. Two of the most gruesome experiments that was done by Mengele and his uh, team at Auschwitz were in the involvement of identical twins. Basically, he would, he would do terrible things to both twins and study their reactions to see what happens. In addition, he was fascinated by people that had dwarfism and people that had two different colors of eye pupils. And mainly the purpose of these experiments was to prevent dwarfism in pure Aryan people, to prevent two different colored uh, pupils in the pure Aryan people. And with the twins, it was actually to promote pro-birth rates of Germans. He wanted pure German Aryans to breed and to produce, and if you had two pure Aryan identical twins, it was the bomb. So his whole purpose with these experiments was to basically promote more eugenics. That was the purpose of it all, and his entire experimental Experiment repertoire was backed, of course, by the Nazis and by Dr. Verschur, who was still pulling the strings from SS headquarters. Uh, as far as the test subjects, he had no regard for their uh, safety, for their comfort, for their lives. Uh, they, they were housed and fed better than the average prisoners, and so they were temporarily spared execution even though they had better food and better living, what he did to them was harrowing. He would go down, for example, to the trains and look for identical twins. He would select two identical twins and he would bring them back. He would give them candy. He would tell them to call him Uncle Migula. And then he would begin to experiment on them. This included everything from injecting dye into the eye for the two-colored pupil experiment. This included uh, amputating uh, limbs and trying to place them on the bodies of the twin, basically switching out body parts. This includes uh, burning, removing of body parts, uh, trying to regenerate body parts, you can't imagine the horrors that these people would have went through. I'd rather go to the gas chamber. I would just rather go to the gas chamber. Uh, he would eventually end their lives by lethal injection, so I guess that's kind of merciful. But uh, the horrors that were described by, that were done by Mingala and his associates were horrible. A former Auschwitz uh, inmate who was a doctor of Jewish descent said of Mingala, he was capable of being so kind to children, to have them become fond of him. He would, he to bring them sugar, to think of small details of their daily lives, and to do things we would generally admire. And then next to that, he would do terrible things to them. The crematoria smoke. These children tomorrow in a half hour, he's going to send them in there, and that is where the anomaly lay. So he would earn the trust of any children, particularly twins, that were part of his experiments. He would give them sugar. He would give them good food, he would hold their hand, walk around with them, talk with them, play with them, and then in the next half hour he could order them executed. It was kind of like a movie, a movie villain, you know, one of those old movie villains where you have the mustache and they're, ee, you know, and they tie the woman to the train tracks. That's kind of the image I have of Dr. Joseph Mengele, just cray cray, just cray cray, evil, demented, deluded. So, you had all these children, twins, they were subjected to terrible experiments, physical exertion to see how their bodies would react to it. If they were exposed to disease, if one twin died of a disease, 
He would kill the other twin so that he could examine them post-mortem. Uh, he would just use them up, and then when he had no further use for them, he would either kill them by lethal injection or send them to the gas chambers. Uh, reports say that he once killed 14 children in one night by injecting chloroform into their hearts. Children. Uh, again, uh, the injecting of dye into the eyes for the two colored to see if they could essentially make the pupil the same color as the other eye. It would reject in terrible pain, blindness. Uh, he would remove eyes from living patients and then experiment on them further and then kill them eventually. He would extract teeth. Uh, anything that he could do to further his sick machinations, all to prevent these deformities from showing up in the uh, Aryan bloodline. Auschwitz survivor Vera Alexander, in his famous account of Mingala, once uh, noted how he took two Romanian twins, two uh, gypsy twins, and sewed them together to create conjoined twins. After both twins died of gangrene, he said that Mingala was even more... Uh, driven to do the same experiment again and this is the kind of conditions that these people lived under not only outside did you have death and labor and the most horrible things inside these barracks where people considered them to be lucky that they were getting food and warmth they were being subjected to the most horrible experiments you could think of then enter 1945 with the advance of the allies and the red army into auschwitz uh, basically auschwitz was abandoned uh, Mingala and his medical crew transferred to the Grossen, uh, Gross Rosen concentration camp, and he took with him all the records and some of his specimens preserved uh, out of Auschwitz, but most of his research, most of the medical records of everything that went on at Auschwitz were destroyed by the Nazis long before the Russians got there on January 27th. When it was obvious that all the concentration camps were going to fall, either to Russian, American, uh, American slash Canadian, or British forces, uh, he fled. He fled with his medical crew uh, about a week before the Soviets arrived at Gross, uh, Gross Rosen. He traveled re westward, uh, disguised as a Czechoslovakian uh, uh, army officer. Uh, he had entrusted his incriminating documents to a nurse with whom he was having an affair. Remember, he was married. He had one son, but he was having an affair with a couple of nurses and entrusted his true identification documents to this nurse. However, he was eventually taken as a prisoner of war by Americans in June 1945. Uh, he did register under his actual legal last name of Mengele, but due to general disarray among the Allies, he was not identified as being the Mengele. He eventually obtained false papers and went under the name of Fritz Yulman, and eventually Fritz Holloman. Uh, he eventually uh, got away. He, after Several months on the run, uh, he basically found work under his new name, Fritz Holloman, uh, in Rosenheim as a farmhand. Uh, he basically got out of Germany uh, on April 17th, 1949, because he knew that his capture would mean immediate trial and probably death. Uh, he was assisted by a network of former SS members, uh, basically a Nazi underground railroad and was eventually smuggled onto a ship that sailed for Argentina in July of 1949. His wife wanted none of his shenanigans and would not go with him, keeping their son, so he left Germany alone. Uh, let's talk about Argentina, <laughs> shall we? Argentina has long been kind of synonymous with Nazis. They were huge Nazi sympathizers, the Perones, as in Evita, Ava, her husband, was a huge Nazi sympathizer, and so he welcomed all these former Nazis coming into Argentina, and so he got, Mingala got to Argentina, he worked as a carpenter in Buenos Aires, uh, living in a boarding house. After a few weeks, he was able to get to a farm owned by a Nazi sympathizer, where he worked as a farmhand, and then eventually got his own place. He started working as a salesman for his 
uh, for Mingala and Sons, his uh, father's farm equipment company, selling uh, equipment that was manufactured right there in Argentina. And uh, eventually uh, kind of struck up a medical practice there. Uh, he practiced med medicine without a license uh, in Buenos Aires, including performing abortions. So his thirst for playing God still kind of resonated with him. In 1956, after eventually buying a house and living it up in Argentina, he became reacquainted with both his son, Rolf, who had no idea who he was, was simply told he was his uncle, and his uh, sister-in-law, the sister of his former wife, his ex-wife. Uh, they met up in uh, Switzerland. He actually was ballsy enough to leave Argentina and go skiing in Switzerland and met up with Rolf and his widowed sister-in-law, they struck up a relationship, and she moved back with him to Argentina. And with that, he dropped the whole Fritz Holloman thing and began living under his real name uh, with Martha and her son, Carl. He continued to practice medicine without a license until a lawsuit involving a young woman that died after one of his illegal abortions kind of shut that down. He was able to settle that and get out of it and kind of retire to a quiet life in Buenos Aires. However, Israel was out to get him. The Mossad, which was a, uh effort by the Israeli government to bring uh, Nazi war crimes criminals to justice. Mingala was on the top of their top ten list. And he was uh, absolutely under surveillance. And he was absolutely a prime target for to be seized and taken. Upon hearing that there was activities to try to bring him in, because again, he's living under his real name now, he fled Argentina for Paraguay and lived right on the Argentina border for uh, about a year. He was eventually able to relocate back into Buenos Aires, where he became part owner of a pharmaceutical company and lived pretty much a regular life until dying from a stroke in 1977. He was never repented for his crimes. He believed that the Nazi way was the best way, and most people believe he was just downright evil. Uh, that's all I can say about him. Good riddance to bad rubbish. Uh, that's not the end of it, though. Authorities of several uh, ally countries uh, led by West Germany did exhume his body in the 80s and study it to ensure it actually was him. They wanted to make sure he was dead, and it was him, and then they studied his skeleton and experimented on it for years, which I think is kind of a come up as being that he liked to experiment on other people. Just a sweet, sweet irony. His skeleton is now stored at San Paulo Institute for Forensic Medicine at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. And though and thus ends the life of one of the most evil men to ever walk the face of the earth. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll be back soon with uh, another true crime video. And until then, keep on crime.